Okay. Let's go ahead and get started here. So welcome to today's session titled Nutrition for um, Adults 50 and Older. Before we get started, I'd like to go through some housekeeping items. So please keep yourself muted throughout the whole session to keep background noise to a minimum. The session will be recorded. Um, if you have any questions, please use our chat function to type your questions in the box and then we'll respond to them at the end. Um, now, you don't have to be 50 and over to be in this session, so I don't want you to assume that this is only for, for older adults. Uh, nutrition as we age does become more important to think about because the cumulative effects of long, you know, lifelong dietary habits do determine our nutritional status as we age. According to the CDC, um, ac um, longevity depends on your access to health care genetics, the environment, such as pollution, access to water resources, etc., And then of course, lifestyle factors that include smoking, nutrition and eating, and also exercise and sleep and stress. So today we're gonna to talk about one of those lifestyle factors, um, nutrition and eating. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start off with introductions to the dietitian. So, um, so you, you know who we are. We'll define what whole foods, plant-based eating looks like. We'll help you understand how nutrition plays a role in aging, identify key nutrients of concern as we age and how the body changes during menopause. And we'll discuss how hydration changes as we age as well. And then the pros and cons of dietary supplements compared to food. And lastly, we'll open it up for questions. So um, just a quick disclosure, Linda and I do work for Sweet Pea Plant Feast Kitchen. Um, we both have the same last name, but um, we're not related. Linda's actually in Missouri and I'm in Rochester. Uh, Linda is new to the organization. She's been here with us for about a month now. And I'll go ahead and let Linda share a little bit more about herself. All right, thanks, Jen. Again, my name is Linda Nguyen. Um, I'm one of the dietitians here at Sweet Pea Plant-Based Kitchen. And yes, I am based in Missouri. So I completed my undergraduate studies at St. Louis University and my master's degree at Ball State University. Shortly after graduation, I started working at St. Luke's Hospital where I still am working part-time today. I work inpatient as well as at the cardiac rehab facility where I teach nutrition workshops, and provide cooking demos to promote the benefits of a predominantly whole foods plant-based diet. I myself have been vegan for plant-based for over five years now, and my advice for those considering going on completely plant-based diet is that it only gets better with time. Allow yourself to make some mistakes and strive for progress, not perfection. Thank you, Linda. Uh, great advice. <laughs> and my name is Jen Wynn. I'm Director of Nutrition at Sweet Pea Plant-Based Kitchen. I completed my undergrad in nutrition from, and dietetics from Cal State Long Beach. So I am originally from California and moved to Rochester um, to complete my dietetic internship at Cornell University. Uh, to keep up with my clinical skills, I also work per diem at Highland Hospital. Shortly after joining the Sweet Pea team, I did complete the plant-based nutrition certificate program through the Center for Nutrition Studies. Growing up, I did eat several plant-based or vegan meals a month for religious reasons. Plants were and still are a huge part of my life growing up, but fast food and processed foods and meats were too. So my journey to whole food plant-based eating is ongoing and I make a conscious effort to eat plant-based primarily for environmental and health reasons. So um, in today's session, we, we, we always like to go through a brief introduction of whole food plant-based diet and what the word diet means in our vocabulary as dietitians, um, because it can mean several things. On the slide here, you see it used in two different ways. So first is how food and beverages are regularly, regularly consumed, such as the vegetables you know, a vegetarian diet, the Mediterranean diet. And secondly, it can also be linked to the habitual nourishment for things like disease therapy. For example, someone who has chronic kidney disease and is hospitalized might be prescribed a renal diet. And another example is before or after a major surgery, individuals are put on a clear liquid diet. 
the definition of the word diet that you don't see here and one that we tread lightly on is um, the definition for that that word diet is a regimen of eating and drinking sparingly so as to reduce one's weight. So when someone say that someone says that they're going on a diet, it usually involves a major caloric restriction, um, cutting out foods, and um, restricting foods. And the difference between that and our program, we do market our program as a weight loss program, but really the underlying goal for us as dietitians is to educate you on how to make whole food plant-based eating work to fit your life. And so when we're using the word diet in that context, it's more so how are we going to work in these foods into your life to make this uh, sustainable for you and to, to focus more on the health aspects. So let's talk a little bit about what whole food plant-based eating is. So you're probably aware of the foods that are not included in whole food plant-based diet, but let's shift our focus on the foods that we can have because there is a lot more variety that's included versus excluded. So you see here, we have fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, and then also minimally processed foods. So minimally processed foods include things such as plant-based milks, cereals, breads, pickles, fermented foods, et cetera. These are foods that are still in its natural and original form. It may be slightly altered for the main purpose of preservation, but does not substantially change the nutritional content of the food. Now let's take a look like, uh, take a look at the um, excluded list because I do want to point out on this list something that is usually eye-opening for most people who um, start to go whole food plant-based diet, and that is oil. So the reason why we don't include oil is oils do go through a highly refined process to become an oil. Oils also have a certain shelf life when they become exposed to air, heat, and light. They start to oxidize or break down. So we start to lose the antioxidants and phytonutrients that are found in, in olive oil. Additionally, one tablespoon of oil can add up to about 120 calories per day. So if you think about three meals a day, that's about 250 calories per day, which is sometimes a meal for most people. Oils also have certain smoke points where they start to break down and form carcinogenic compounds that are harmful to the body. If it's past cooked, cooked past that smoke point. Um, small studies have also been done to reveal that some oils may also damage blood vessels as well as form atherosclerotic plaques. So for those who are concerned with heart disease, eliminating oil may be an important consideration. So under the umbrella of vegetarian diets, we have seven different subcategories under this. And you also see that vegan, whole food plant-based are also listed here. So someone who is lacto-vegetarian excludes meat, fish, poultry, and eggs. They may still consume milk and dairy products. Someone who is ovo-vegetarian uh, ovo will exclude meat, fish, poultry, and milk. So they may still consume um, eggs. And then someone who's lacto-ovo will exclude meat, fish, poultry, and still consume dairy products and eggs. And then you have your pescatarian and poultarian. So pescatarians will consume mostly fish. They'll exclude meat and poultry. Someone who's poultarian will still consume chicken but ex or chicken or poultry and exclude meat and fish. And then you have your vegan. So I'm gonna shift over to that chart that you see on the right hand column here. So you see that someone who is vegan um, typically will exclude all animal products. They may still consume oils. Someone who is whole food plant-based, um, we, you know, is typically no, nothing processed, including meat, including dairy and eggs. So the foods that are consumed are the whole grains, fruits, veggies, and then the legumes here, and then also the nuts and seeds. I'm going to have Linda shift and we're going to move right into our presentation to talk about aging and nutritional requirements. All right, thanks, Jen. So while the nutritional needs remain relatively the same as young adults, 
People over the age of 50 do require fewer calories, but more key nutrients such as calcium, vitamin D, B12, uh, and possibly more protein. Going back to the, uh, the calories, right? So, you know, in the aspect of calories, um, muscle tissue burns calories while fat tissue doesn't. So as a result, women around the age of 60 have an average of three and a half pounds less muscle tissue than they did around the 20s. And for men, it's about seven pounds. So that shift from that muscle to fat can be due to changes in your hormones and metabolism. So research has shown that it slows down about one to 2% per decade from ages 20 to 40 if that body weight is constant. So per decade, a man can expend 100 calories fewer while women expend 70 calories fewer per day. And although some of these factors cannot be completely controlled, Increased fat tissue is strongly influenced by lifestyle choices, such as poor nutrition and exercise. We also must consider changes that affect nutrient intake. So certainly there are factors that can work against us in achieving optimal nutrition. There's changes in appetite, taste, and smell. At age 70, people may have about 30% of their taste buds than they did as young adults. Medication can directly affect taste buds as well, as well as nutrient status. For example, proton pump inhibitors, which is often prescribed to treat peptic ulcers or heartburn, are linked to calcium and other nutrient deficiencies. Then tension and oral health may also play a significant role on food selections as individuals may experience dental issues, such as ill-fitting dentures, loss of teeth that can make chewing difficult. We also have changes in mobility, which can be limiting to being able to prepare your own meals. Seniors are at a high risk for bone fractures and injury. So let's talk about bone health. When thinking of bone health, there are three key nutrients that come to mind, which are calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Adequate calcium is linked with prevention and reduction of osteoporosis, colon cancer, hypertension. For people older than 50, the recommended intake for calcium increases from 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams per day, but some experts even suggest that 1,500 milligrams per day um, after 65 because of the body's ability to absorb calcium declines. Adults older than 70 need more calcium and vitamin D to help maintain bone health than they did in their younger years. Weight-bearing exercises can help that body retain calcium in the bones. Vitamin D is known as that sunshine vitamin because it's produced when your skin is exposed to the sun. Not only does the body need vitamin D for calcium absorption, but vitamin D regulates bone mass and also plays a vital role in immune function. It is recommended for adults up to age 70 um, to get about 600 IUs per day. Adults over age 70 is about 800 IUs. It is highly recommended that you speak with your primary care physician regarding your vitamin D status. It is it's quite common to have vitamin D deficiency. A natural way to boost that vitamin D production is to spend about 20 to 30 minutes outside with skin exposure to the sun. Vitamin K helps to maintain that complex protein mineral structure of bones. Some observational studies point to vitamin K as an anti-inflammatory nutrient for age-related diseases such as cardiovascular disease and osteoarthritis. Just adding about half a cup of kale, broccoli, or one cup of romaine lettuce has shown to be beneficial. So listed here are some food sources for bone health. For calcium, we have dark leafy green vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, okra, kale, bok choy, collard greens. One serving normally contains about 75 to 100 milligrams of calcium. Calcium can be fortified in unsweetened plant-based milks such as soy milk, almond milk, rice, rice, pea, and oat drinks. A good source of plant-based protein 
packed with calcium could be tofu, as well as beans, pulses, sesame seeds, and tahini. Dried fruits such as raisins, prunes, figs, and dried apricots are also good sources as well. Food sources of vitamin D are mushrooms. However, they have to be raw and exposed to UV light. Fortified plant-based milks and fortified cereals also can provide some sources of vitamin D. And again, for vitamin K, good sources are your leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables. Another key nutrient is potassium. Potassium is an essential mineral and serves as electrolytes. So electrolytes conduct electrical impulses throughout the body. They assist in a range of essential body functions, including uh, managing blood pressure, normal water balance, muscle contractions, digestion, heart rhythm. Healthy kidneys maintain normal potassium levels in the body because they remove excess amounts through urine. However, there are certain conditions that can cause potassium deficiencies or what we call hypokalemia. These include kidney disease, excessive sweating, diarrhea, vomiting, magnesium deficiencies, and overuse of diuretics. There are also several drugs and medications that can interfere, interfere with the absorption, such as insulin, antibiotics, and steroids. Your body doesn't produce potassium naturally, so it's important to consume the right balance of potassium-rich foods and beverages. So listed are some food sources of potassium here. So let's talk about vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is an essential vitamin for the cells. It's important for keeping your nerves, blood cells, and DNA healthy. Vitamin B12 also plays a role in energy metabolism and maintaining normal brain function. Symptoms such as confusion, memory loss, fatigue, and depression may be related to the shortage of this vitamin. Most adults are getting their vitamin B12 through animal products such as meats, dairy, and eggs. There's not a lot of plant-based foods that naturally contain vitamin B12, so people who follow a vegeta vegetarian diet need to make sure they get enough each day to avoid a deficiency. The reference daily intake is about 2.4 micrograms. Optimally for those uh, age 65 and older should take at least 500 micrograms per day and some do best with around 1000 micrograms daily. So what about natural foods sources um, for those following a whole food plant-based diet? Nutritional yeast, Certain mushrooms and some algae contain vitamin B12. B12 can also be found in fortified cereals. For example, um, you can obtain your six, about 62% of your vitamin B12 needs by just having a cup of Raisin Bran cereal. You can also meet your vitamin B12 needs by adding two tablespoons of nutritional yeast to your food. So I'm going to talk about fiber, which is another very important nutrient. Fiber, um, as we know, is important for preventing gastrointestinal diseases and disorders. It reduces constipation, allows for the body to get rid of waste. It acts as a natural form of de detoxification in the body. Fiber also binds to cholesterol to remove it from the bloodstream, and it also allows for the absorption, the slows the absorption of blood sugars in the bloodstream. There are many studies linking fiber to the reduction of chronic diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, and colorectal cancer. Two observational studies revealed that on average, we only get about half of what is recommended daily, which is about 10 to 15 grams per day. While on a whole food plant-based diet, however, people can get anywhere between 25 to 40 grams per day. Um, studies have shown that for every eight gram increase in dietary fiber eaten each day, the total number of deaths in cases of heart disease, diabetes, and colorectal cancer can be decreased by five to 27%. Um, if you are new to whole food plant-based eating, we do suggest slowly increasing your fiber intake to avoid any gastrointestinal distress. 
Also ensure that you drink plenty of water um, and we'll touch on how much shortly. And if you've had um, GI issues before, please check with your doctor to ensure that you can safely incorporate fiber. So fiber recommendations for um, men and women are slightly different. So for women, it's 25 grams per day. For men, it's about 38 grams per day. And again, being on a whole food plant-based diet because you're consuming all of the different food groups like fruits, nuts and seeds, vegetables, whole grains, um, legumes, all of those food groups actually do have fiber in them. So let's talk about protein here. Um, protein um, have complex structures. They're made up of smaller units um, called amino acids and are linked together in a chemical bond forming a long chain. Some of these um, um, links of amino acids are essential amino acids, meaning that they're crucial for life and must be gained through eating or through your diet. So the importance of protein is related to reducing risk of sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the progressive and generalized skeletal muscle disorder involving accelerated loss of muscle mass and function. Muscle mass is made up of protein and protein provides strength and structure to your tissues. And according to an article published by Harvard Health, after the age of 30, um, we can begin losing as much as three to 5% of muscle mass per decade. So very important to make sure that you keep up with the protein intake. Proteins also involved in our, the formation and structure of our skin, hair, and nails. Hormones and enzymes also rely on protein for physiological function, such as fluid, ba fluid balance, antibodies to fight off infection, transport of oxygen to around the body. So really important that you make sure that we keep up with the protein intake. And we'll talk about how much shortly here. Um, sarcopenia is one of the things that we focus on for older adults because the risk of falls that lead to hospitalizations um, can cause disabil disability and potentially even early death. Older adults also have lower rates of protein synthesis and whole body uh, proteolysis in response to an anabolic stimulus. Um, so food or resistance exercises that anabolic stimulus. So when you're looking at plant-based proteins, soy actually comes closest to animal protein. Um, it contains good amounts of all of the nine essential amino acids. It was thought at one point that you needed to combine certain plant proteins to get a complete protein, but science has shown that the liver can actually store amino acids over the course of a day to ensure the nitrogen retention for healthy individuals. So when comparing the nutrient profiles of animal proteins versus plant proteins, the primary difference is that animal proteins contain saturated fat which we know excess, excess intake of saturated fat can lead to high cholesterol, leading to an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, additionally, animal proteins do, can, do have higher amounts of leucine. However, there is also leucine found in other, other sources of protein as well, plant-based proteins, um, such as tofu, tempeh, lentils, seitan, and uh, contain the highest sources of lysine, followed by other legumes. Um, quinoa, amaranth, pistachios, pumpkin seeds also contain adequate amounts of leucine as well. Um, the difference, the main difference between plant proteins and animal proteins is, of course, fiber, as we talked about. In addition to that, when you're consuming plant proteins, you're also getting all of the phytonutrients and an antioxidants that you can't find in the animal proteins. So it is overall a far superior product if you're looking at it from a nutritional standpoint or nutrient standpoint. Now the recommended intake um, according to research and experts um, suggests 1.0 to 1.2 grams per kilogram of dietary protein combined with resistance training twice a week to reduce age-related muscle mass loss. Um, the general population, so folks that are older, you know, younger than that, older than 50, 
an average intake recommendation is anywhere between 0.8 to 1.0 grams per kilogram. Now, if individuals have chronic conditions um, and also healing wounds, it's recommended to increase protein by as much as 1.5 grams per kilograms. Additionally, older individuals with kidney disease will actually have less protein because the kidneys are involved in processing protein. And if it's not able to keep up, it will cause urea to build up in the bloodstream, which is toxic to the body. Um, where you can find sources of protein. So you can find sources of protein. So the richest sources come from beans, lentils, peas, peanuts, soy, seitan, which is a vital wheat group from flour, nuts and seeds. So half a cup of beans can provide up to eight grams of protein. You combine that with your cup of green veggies and your half a cup of whole grains or a cup of whole grains, you can get close to about 20 to 25 grams of protein per meal. And that's equivalent to about a chicken breast. And our bodies can really only break, take up to about 25 grams of protein in one meal. So it is crucial to stay within that range. And that's the recommended recommendation per meal is to be between that 20 to 25 grams of protein. Um, additional sources of protein include whole grain varieties like farro, um, kamut, and wheat berries. Um, those can actually provide up to 11 grams of protein per cup. So next we're going to talk about a really big topic that um, we hear very often, which is menopause. So menopause occurs one year after the last period, typically at age 51. Um, this is where hormonal changes increase the rate at which women store visceral fat, um, which is unfortunate. So um, visceral fat surrounds the vital organs deep within the abdomen and precipitate changes in insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism, putting women at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Emerging research has revealed that changes at the cellular level cause menopausal women to store more fat. That's a ability to store fat. So with these physiological changes, it's extremely important to focus on the day-to-day -day behaviors and lifestyle choices, such as daily exercise, limiting certain foods such as alcohol, caffeine, and dairy. Um, research does show that caffeine is associated with tampering with the vasomotor symptoms such as like hot flashes and sweating, which then could lead to sleep disturbances. And then of course the gastrointestinal changes, which is where um, potentially eliminating dairy could also be helpful, helpful there as well. And lastly, we're going to talk about hydration status in terms of the different things that we should be paying attention to. So the human body is constantly losing water. Thus, if fluids aren't replaced, the body eventually doesn't have enough water. Water makes up about 55 to 65 percent of our bodies. And between the ages of 20 to 80 years old, it's estimated that our body water content actually decreases by about 15 percent. So Dehydration is common, is a common cause of hospitalizations for older adults due to the diminishing sensation of thirst. Um, that can then lead to incontinence, decreased mobility, and um, alcohol. We want to just point out that alcohol does um, is does act as a diuretic. diuretic. Um, how, how it does that is it inhibits and suppresses the release of a hormone known as vasopressin, which is the um, anti-diuretic hormone. Vasopressin signals the kidney to actually hold on to water. And so when that hormone is suppressed, it causes the kidneys to actually release more water. Hence, we feel more dehydrated. So a general recommendation is um, anywhere between six to eight cups per day. And of course, adjusting to the weather, if it's warmer outside, physical activity, if you're sweating a little bit, make, make sure that you consume a little bit more than the eight cups. And then certain diseases and medications that may require fluid limitations may limit your water intake for the day. Um, so sources, other sources of liquids, um, we want to also note that it's important 
um, to also ensure that you're, now that we're in the summer months, that we also have lots of fruits and vegetables that have high water content, such as melons, cucumbers, tomatoes. Um, those types of fruits and vegetables can also contribute to your water consumption too. Um, so, so it is important to include that and then also ensure that you're consuming at least a six to eight ounce per day. So um, we're gonna touch briefly on supplements because supplements are a billion dollar industry in America and around the world. Um, with the typical American diet being heavy and processed foods, um, that means that we're, we're nutrient poor internally. Thus many Americans fall short of nutrients and often rely on dietary supplements to fill in the gaps. However, there are toxicity levels associated with certain nutrients and differences in bioavailability. Additionally, herbs and botanicals should also be looked at because they do have side effects um, when, you're consume, when you're having those herbs and botanicals and having medication as well. So supplements are manufactured all over the world. Vitamins and supplements in most cases come in synthetic forms. And that's even if the label says natural, there's a really small percentage of that supplement that is actually natural. And this is important to note because some of the enzymes in the human body only work properly with a vitamin of the correct shape, which means that they have to have the same chemical constituents, but they potentially work differently in the body. So when we give the body concentrated forms of synthetic nutrients, it doesn't always work appropriately to the proper delivery system. Hence, it's um, less bioavailable for the body to use. The cost of um, whole foods is far less compared to dietary supplements and is more promising in terms of its absorption rate. Well, moreover, due to the conflicting studies that are done on supplements, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force actually does not support vitamin and mineral supplement to ward off disease. So if you see a health claim on a dietary supplement, I would encourage you to stay away from that supplement. So um, Linda touched on some common drug nutrient interactions. So this is especially important because supplements do come in concentrated forms. So um, just be very careful, do your research um, online before purchasing any supplements. And again, that also includes the herbs and botanicals as well. So in conclusion, the nutrition, best nutrition for optimal health is from whole foods and what you actually eat and not from what we get in a pill or a capsule. And then we also provided a resource here for you from, um, so if you're ever looking for recommendations on how do I, you know, how do I know how much of what nutrient I'm supposed to be having per day, the Office of Dietary Supplements is a great guide. They offer, um, you know, background information on the supplement, how it benefits you. They offer what the recommended daily is, um, what are some food sources and how can you meet your intake through food sources. Um, and so that is a great resource to just save and you can just Google Office of Dietary Supplements and it'll pop up and allow for you to search by individual needs. All right, so here we have some practical tips uh, for you. Um, we recommend you know, to increase physical activity to maintain that adequate bone and muscle health. You wanna aim for about two to three days of strength exercise, along with two to three days of aerobic exercise. You wanna consume high quality nutrients from whole foods as they are more bioavailable, um, bio readily available. Hydration becomes more important due to that decreased thirst sensation. And again, these are some um, vitamins and nutrients that you wanna pay special attention to, such as vitamin B12, calcium, vitamin D, potassium, protein, and fiber. So with that, we are going to go ahead and open it up for any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and you are welcome to ask any questions at all.
Diane, do you have any questions for us? Um, my only question is, are some of these uh, papers, the notes that you had and things that you displayed, is there a way to get them sent so that I could have them to look over and re-view um, at different times when I was questioning things? Sure, yes, we can certainly send you like a, a PDF version so there are clickable links on there in case there are any links on the slides. So yes, we can definitely send that to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, with that, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, next month, we do have another session, and the session will be on plant-based nutrition for athletes or for those who are um, leisurely athletes. So plant-based sports nutrition is our next webinar, and that will be um, in July. So stay tuned for that. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I hope everyone has a great week. Thank you.